Hi, I'm Gary Leslie, and I'm a member of the Middlesex Black Jewish Coalition. And one of the missions of the coalition is to advocate for legislation that could possibly benefit our communities. So, with that in mind, two bills have been introduced in our New Jersey State Legislature recently. Their purpose is to establish a reparations task force to look into the impact of racism in our state, as well as possible ways of addressing that impact. To find out more about these bills, Adina Brown, the coalition's co-chair, spoke to Ryan Haygood, the president and CEO of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Adina Brown. I am one of the co-chairs of the Middlesex Black Jewish Coalition of Middlesex. So today we're going to be talking with Ryan Haygood. As you all may know, he is the president and CEO of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Without further ado, I just want to let Ryan speak a little bit about himself first. Too. Go ahead, Ryan. It's great to be here with you, Councilwoman Brown. As you mentioned, my name is Ryan Higgood. I have the real privilege of uh, leading the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Uh, our mission here really is to identify what we think of as structural load-bearing walls of racial inequality that when knocked down because of our collective advocacy, really open up opportunities for Black people and people of color more broadly across New Jersey. I do want to point out real quick the actual like letters for the bill because if anyone you know wants to advocate and we'll obviously give more information about how the average citizen can advocate for this bill but I want to say the numbers are S322-A711 so that is the specific bill that we're talking about today. I think our organization, I'm sure everyone else watching wants to know what's really the purpose. Like, what do you hope to accomplish with this bill specifically? Sure. So great, great question. You know, I think we're all sort of standing on a foundation, right? And that foundation is cracked. And those cracks are the cracks of structural racism. And although we did not create those cracks, we didn't create this foundation. We, we inherited it. Um, people of conscience, are really required to take responsibility for it and responsibility for filling in those cracks and building a new foundation. So there's a, there's a national conversation happening right now around race. And that conversation is happening right here in New Jersey too. And it's important to make that conversation specific to New Jersey. You know, we think a lot about how New Jersey is an interesting sort of tale of, of two states, right? On one hand, New Jersey is the wealthiest state in the country each year, this year, I think we're second only to Maryland, but we're also a state where there's some real uh, punishing poverty that exists alongside that prosperity. We're, according to the 2020 census, one of the most racially diverse states in the country. People of color will soon be a majority of our state, but we're also a state where that really rich diversity exists alongside some really entrenched racial segregation. And so those two realities lead to the numbers, the mathematics, the racial disparities that we at the Institute spend a lot of time focusing on. Those racial disparities reflect racial inequalities that are some of the, of the worst in the country. Black people in New Jersey face some of the worst racial disparities in every direction, in mm -hmm. housing, in education, in healthcare, in employment, in wealth, in criminal justice, in infant mortality. And all of those racial disparities, they emanate from New Jersey's history of slavery. And so at its core, the heart of this legislation that, that you mentioned, Councilwoman, is really designed to lead us into a conversation, finally, about New Jersey's role in slavery. People don't often appreciate the way it happened here, or that New Jersey was once called the slave state of the North. That is a reality that we are required to grapple with because we continue to live several hundred years later in the shadow and the legacy of slavery. And so this is really, I think, a moment to recognize that take responsibility for that and then begin to think about, so how do we repair the enduring harm from that institution? Yeah. So who's currently sponsoring these bills? Yeah, so we're really fortunate to have pretty widespread support, particularly among the Legislative Black Caucus. I think most of the Black elected officials in the state legislature, legislature have mm -hmm. signed on to the bill. On the assembly side, it's championed by Assemblywoman Shavonda Sumter and Brittany Timberlake and uh, Verlina Reynolds-Jackson on the Senate side, uh, Senator Ronald Rice, 
Uh, mm -hmm. Senator Loretta Weinberg, Senator Cunningham, Senator Shirley Turner. So we, we there's a, there is support. We need to get on the uh, Senate side to 21 and the Assembly side 41. So 21 and 41 of the votes we need. We're building support for it now. But I will say to you, Councilwoman, that although we've we've enjoyed some support, we've got a ways to go, and we have encountered some some resistance, including uh, some resistance from Speaker Craig Coughlin. Uh, mm -hmm. who, as, as you know, is an elected official, in order to move bills to the legislature, you need the leadership on the assembly side, that's Craig Coughlin, on the Senate side, that's um, Senate President Steve Sweeney to move bills. Yeah. And so it was actually a conversation we had with Speaker Craig Coughlin that inspired the name of our campaign. We, we met with him about a year ago to get support for this bill. He had real trouble with the word reparations. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, I would support I would support this task force today if you could call it something else. You can call it a wealth gap task force or a, a racial disparity task force, something other than a task force with the word reparations in it. And we said back to him, listen, the fact that we're asking you for a task force, which at its core is about having a conversation that results in conversations reduced to a writing with recommendations that's the concession, right? We're making a concession by asking for a task force, which is often what politicians do when they don't want to do something. They create a task force, right? It issues a report and you put the yeah. you put the findings up here. But we've asked for that because we think that's the most thoughtful way to get at this issue. Yeah. So we said, listen, the least that we can do, given that we're asking for a task force, is be clear about what it is. Mm. It is a reparations task force. The purpose of it is to talk about the way slavery happened in New Jersey and to contend with that. And then he began to make recommendations to repair that enduring harm. And so he, Craig Coughlin, our assembly speaker, gave birth to the name of our campaign, which is called Say the Word, hmm. Reparations. And the idea is to take the sting out of the word, word to be very clear that unless and until we have an honest conversation about why it is, for example, that in New Jersey, Black people confront some of the worst racial disparities in America. Until we get to the heart of why that is, and that, of course, is not a reflection of personal failures on the part of Black people. That is a reflection of a system designed in slavery in our state with vestiges that we still live in view of. Until we get to that conversation by saying the word reparations, we can never get to a better moment. And I do think our best moments in New Jersey are ahead of us, mm. but I think we only ever realize those if we're prepared to say the word and do the work to repair. You kind of touched on the answer to this question already, but you know, what would be the real function of this task force? Yeah. Yeah, what do you think they're, you know, what would be their day-to-day, -day, I guess, as, as you want to call it? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I think it would be a collect, so it's an officially created body, task force, a commission made up of some of the leading scholars, community leaders, voices, including national voices from various disciplines, obviously history, sociology, um, healthcare, higher learning, faith leaders, economists, right? It would be a real collection of leaders who would dig into the history of our state, but then as importantly would make recommendations about how best to respond, the kinds of policies and practices that we would need to see, the kinds of investments to make to repair the harm. It, I think it would be a real important moment for New Jersey. And here's the thing, right? We're talking about a reparations task force that would begin to address the harm that black people continue to face. But it's not just a benefit to black people because well, we all, all of us, everyone in New Jersey, more than 9 million people, we all stand on this foundation that's cracked. And we know that, that those cracks impact us all. They impact di black people directly because we, we were, we are the descendants of enslaved people in this state. Yeah. But this is all of our state. And so yes, there's a direct benefit to black folks, but there's also, a broader benefit to all of us because, you know, because I do think in the real sense, and I don't mean to be corny here, but we are in fact in this thing called life together. So it's absolutely the case that pe non-Black people 
have been in white electeds and white allies more broadly have been some of our best supporters and our effort through say the word reparations, the campaign is to generate a wider and wider spread support for this work. I, I do wanna ask, um, and again, we touched on this as well. Um, you know, what? why is this necessary in New Jersey? I know we did kind of touch on the fact that New Jersey has kind of been known to be a progressive state for so long. And especially now, you know, compared to what's going on in other states, we're definitely considered more progressive. But, you know, why do you feel like this is necessary in New Jersey? As I shared, New Jersey is one of the wealthiest states in the country. Some years were the wealthiest. This year we're second uh, only to Maryland. It's in New Jersey that the individual net wealth for white adults is $106,000. That's among the highest in the country. $106,000 individual net wealth for white adults. And that's largely tied to home ownership, right? But for black adults in New Jersey, the individual net wealth is 179 United States dollars, right? It's a staggering number. That's obviously less than the cost of a lot of things, groceries for a small family, uh, shoes, depending on how much you spend on your kid's shoes, certainly a laptop, telephone, all manner of things, less than the individual net wealth that black people have in New Jersey, $179. Now there's, there's real reactions to that. One is, well, why? Hmm. What accounts for that? vast racial disparity and one response is often well that's because there's something wrong if you get honest mm -hmm. something wrong with black folks right mm -hmm. we don't work hard so we don't have income when we do work we we're prodigal with our finances we don't spend well like the, the reason it's so low is because there's something wrong with us it's so high for white folks because white folks do something right we do something wrong right that's the personal failure argument but the real reason has nothing at all to do with individual choices in fact, the real reason we have this astonishing racial wealth gap in New Jersey is because it was designed that way in slavery when New Jersey was formed as a colony. Mm -hmm. That ours was a colony that racialized land ownership at its beginning. We gave 150 acres of land to each white English settling family, each white mm -hmm. English settling family as an incentive to bring them to New Jersey, 150 acres of land. Mm -hmm. And we also gave those families an additional 150 acres of land for each enslaved Black person who worked on that land. So we incentivized, mm -hmm. a, we created a racial wealth gap at our founding as a colony. And then when slavery ended, we had our own form of sharecropping. Here we called it cottaging. And when cottaging in, ended, we saw things like racially restrictive covenants that dictated where Black folks could live and, and could not live. We saw selective use of the GI Bill for Black and other World War II veterans who returned back home. We saw subprime lending practices and redlining, which created whole cities like Newark, Camden, mm -hmm. Trenton, Atlantic City. So there's a direct line today from our racial wealth gap traceable directly back to slavery. Yeah. So I lift that up because we are not talking about a conversation whose time has passed. Like Ryan, councilwoman, slavery was way back then. You got to get over it. The reality is it was so thoroughly designed, this system in slavery, that it will perpetuate itself always until we confront it and design a new system, mm -hmm. which is what this reparations task force in New Jersey is all about how do we create for our kids a new system, yeah. a new foundation by filling in those cracks? And it can't happen if we're not willing to say the word reparation. You know, I do also wonder, you know, and I'm sure everyone's thinking about this because when we think of reparations, we think of just handouts, right? Mm -hmm. Just giving people a check uh, or a piece of land or something. But what specifically, and I know you can't really speak to every single way in which reparation, reparations would take form. But what are some of the things that the task force might look at being yeah. considered as reparations? Yeah, I love a great question again. So I think you're right. We haven't thought about reparations as simply writing a check right. to X number of Black folks for X right. number of dollars. And in fact, that kind of thinking, right, underappreciates this under this undertaking by a lot, yes. right? Because 
even if someone were to write a check for X amount of dollars, X amount of black folks, it wouldn't get at the structural challenges. It wouldn't get at the system that has created the racial wealth gap. Yeah. So if you take the racial wealth gap, for example, that is largely a function of home ownership. You, you and I are talking right now, I'm in Newark, where our office is housed, where I live. Mm-hmm. You know, Newark is, is a city with incredible resources, uh, mm-hmm. but it's also a city where 80% of the people who live here rent. And if home ownership is the primary driver of wealth, as it is, how do you build wealth in a city like Newark, where only 20% of the residents own their homes? Hmm. So one real question for us to think about is, so then what kinds of policies, practices, behaviors do we put in place that deepen home ownership? And we've read about a a good number of them that deepen home ownership, right? There are zero interest loans that are that, that could be made available. There's turning Section 8 ho- uh, housing vouchers into mortgage payments and empowering people to own the places where they live. There's land banking and land trust. There's a lot of very creative things to do that can deepen home ownership. Um, and I think there's, they're, they're available, right? I think this, this task force is really designed to be intentional about answering your question. Some of the ideas we have, right, but they're greater minds, certainly than mine, who can mm. weigh in. And look, even, even in, the, in the wealth gap space, assuming that awesome undertaking makes some, some, we get some traction on that. If you solve the racial wealth gap, you still wouldn't have solved that for, if for, that for example, in New Jersey, a black child is 21 times more likely to be in prison than a white child, even though black and white kids mm. commit most offenses at about the same rate. So this task force would have, um, you know, it's almost like, the old school photographs had like the very narrow shot then there's a panoramic okay. view like this panoramic view would would implicate every discipline we could think of as part of this conversation and the repair would have to happen in, in every direction yeah that's pretty amazing i mean you're you're speaking to someone who has thought about this i mean i don't know for how many years and how many nights right um it's it's a thought that keeps me up at night seriously just thinking about how do we repair the the years of damage, the centuries of damage, really. Um, because like you said, it's not as easy as writing a check. It literally um, involves this like whole process. You know, there's a mindset, there's there's so many things that are involved and, and writing a check definitely wouldn't solve it. I mean, um, this is your interview, but I mean, mm-hmm. let me just I say- love, listen, I, love <laughs> but but I, but I, I will say to your point though, Adina, it's not, you know, very often when we when we get to these conversations, right, very quickly, we talk about what we what we can afford, right? We, right? Our imagination is constrained by, also by an imagined limitation on resources. But it, the way I think about this reparations task force is it's almost like we begin by acknowledging the challenges we have had historically in the and what slavery has done to our state. But together we then imagine, so what kind of state would we build to repair that harm? And this this requires great imagination, right? Yeah. And great creativity. And we think, even if we just were to think about what would we want for our kids, right? What would we want? What kind of New Jersey would we want our kids to inherit? And then comes a, a conversation that doesn't begin with what we cannot do, but really imagines what we, we can and re- what we must do. Right. And that's not so I very often I resist when people say, well, we can't, you know, the, the, those policies are as possible. We, we can't do that for ex, excuse. And I, I resist that because I think instead of beginning with what we don't have, we really ought to think about how great our imagination can be to solve the problems that we confront. We're kind of we're getting to the close here, but I, um, of course, want to ask what can supporters of this bill do? You know, how can they take action and be advocates in their own way, even if they've never been an advocate or an activist before? What can they do? So we need that. We need their voices. You know, we need to lift our collective voices. This is a critical year in New Jersey in the sense that it's an election year where every seat is up in the assembly and the Senate. 120 seats are up for re-election and the governor's running for re-election. And so this is actually a really precious, you know, we started by talking about how we're in this really difficult moment, but it's a precious one too. Yeah. And it's precious because in election years, it is when our elected officials are most responsive to the uh, 
advocacy of constituents. So I, I, I urge people listening to this to go to 400yearsnj.org. Yeah. That's 400yearsnj.org. Uh, that's a, a tool, an advocacy tool that we provide. You punch in just a little bit of personal information, not a lot, but the purpose of the personal information is because the tool will identify your state elected official. And then you can either call, a tweet at, or email. It'll give you those functions, those, those options to communicate directly with your elected official, the legislature, and the governor to urge them to support this bill. Yeah. It's already populated. All you have to do is to go to 400yearsnj.org and communicate. That's direct democracy. That's the democracy that's finest. You lifting up your voice and holding your elected officials accountable is really what this moment requires. And I, I tell you this, if we, when we mm -hmm. lift our voices uh, up enough that they're heard by our elected officials, New Jersey will become the second state to have passed this bill to create this task force. And together, we will have made made history. So here's a poster yeah. that we created with say the word reparations, 400 years nj.org. I encourage folks to go there thank and you. that tool. I just wanna thank you again for your time today. I, I, you know, I could talk about this forever. Listen, I could join gonna, you. Yeah, we- We'll have we, a part two. Well, we, we could certainly have a part two, I love it. So um, I just wanna say really quickly, the Middlesex Black Jewish Coalition um, has decided of course, to partner with the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice to advocate for this bill. And we are so excited to join forces because it's gonna take more than just a black voice to make this happen. If you're watching this and you are not black, please advocate even harder for this because it's so important for us to have a collective voice out here. So I wanna thank you again, Ryan, so much for the time. Thank you so much. You and we will hopefully be speaking again very soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye, Ryan. Mm -hmm.